All right, guys, let's turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37 is where we're going to jump off from today uh, as we continue in our sermon series called Bible Stories, where we're going through the Old Testament and picking out our, our uh, uh, most well-known uh, Sunday school type Bible stories and uh, kind of looking at them uh, from a different angle, trying to get a lot more context in it. Uh, so that we fully understand these stories, if we can get a, a good uh, understanding of the pillars in the Old Testament, then uh, that's only going to help us in our New Testament faith. And so in that, let's turn to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to begin in verse 1 as we knock out our chapter this morning. It says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad with his sons of Bilhau, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and it was told to his brothers that they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf rose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall we indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed down to me. He told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Then his brothers went to feed their flocks in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers, and if it is well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out to the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I have heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see that what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and, and he delivered him out of their hands. And he said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into the pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father." So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty, there was no water in it, and they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted up their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal him in his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let, us, let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers listened. Then Medianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, dipped the tunic in the blood. 
Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it's your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his waist, and mourned his son for many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to come together in your house during this time. And Father, we, we ask that, Lord, as we lift up our voices, as we sing your praise and sing songs to you, Father, that it would be a, a wonderful offering of praise to your ears. And Father, now as we look into your word, Father, we pray that you would guide us, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, that you would convict us, that you would inspire us, Father, that you'd reveal our sinfulness to us, that we may repent. And Father, that you'd reveal your righteousness to us, Lord, so that we can walk in it. Father, we want to be just like you. We want to shine your light in this lost, fallen, and dark, broken world in which we live. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, guys. So here we are. This is a story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. And so this is a, a story that we all pretty much know, uh, should be fairly familiar with. Uh, even if we weren't you know, the, the Sunday school kids, uh, we still probably know this basic outline of the story. And uh, in this, uh, we start out with the main character being Joseph. But to understand Joseph, we kind of have to understand where he came from, what he's dealing with. And so to understand Joseph, we have to back up and understand his father, Jacob. Now, Jacob is one of those characters in Scripture that we're just not quite sure about. He is, uh, in Scripture, we have examples and we have warnings. And sometimes in the same story, we will have an example and a warning all in the same person. And Jacob is one of those examples. So we have grand warnings in the life of Jacob that we can uh, glean from, that we can see. And we also have some good things. But when it came to Joseph, we understand Jacob as a father. And here, Jacob in the father role made some big mistakes, made some really bonehead errors. He had some huge personality flaws, some traits that led to a lot of disaster in their life. So here as we approach Joseph, it's important for us to understand that Joseph spans about 13 chapters in Genesis. There's actually more uh, content on Joseph in the book of Genesis than there is Adam. There's more content in the book of Genesis regarding Joseph than there is Noah. And there's more content in the book of Genesis about Joseph than there is Abraham. Joseph is a pivotal figure. And here he's raised by Jacob. And now Jacob was a classic passive father. Passivity just oozed out of Jacob. Every conflict that he got into, he always found the coward way out. He always uh, tucked tail and ran. He always tried to smooth and lose. He always tried to find the path of least resistance. He didn't stand up and fight. He didn't plant his foot in the ground and say this far, but no farther. He was constantly on retreat all through his life. We even see in his... Uh, in his marriage, he's in retreat as well. He, here he finds a man, he finds a woman that he, his heart just uh, swoons over. And in that, uh, Rachel, he makes an agreement that he will work for Rachel for seven years. But what happens? Seven years passes, the wedding night comes, Jacob's very foolish, and he ends up married to Rachel's sister. And then he says, well, I'll work seven more years for Rachel. And he progresses in, and now he's got this conflict, this brood. Instead of standing forward, taking a stand, saying, no, I was deceived, something happened, this isn't right, uh, you know, and, and uh, pleading for righteousness, for justice in the situation, he just shrinks away. He just says, I'll do it all over again. We'll see if we can fix it the next time around. 
We see as he moves along with his family, here him and his father-in-law continuously have strife and conflict. Uh, he is constantly one that is a deceiver using deception and trickery and half-truths and total lies in order to shape and frame things the way that he wants them to be shaped and framed so that he can get along with his conscience so that he can do some pretty despicable things, even if it means defrauding his father-in-law who defrauded him. And instead of issuing justice, he just becomes unjust all into himself to the point where he circumvents his father his father-in-law's wealth he begins to acquire wealth for himself in his father's name uses a lot of cunning and a lot of trickery then as he retreats and runs from his father-in-law instead of standing firm before him we see his family dragged across a uh, a, a enemy territory and we see some grave consequences play out in the life of Joseph and in the life of Jacob because Jacob wouldn't just simply say no. He always had to find an easy path. So even to the point where as they're moving across and they're moving into Canaan, they're moving along to the promised land, here they run into this band of Hivites. And these Hivites are camped at a town called uh, Shechem. And Shechem continues in the, in the Old Testament narrative. It kind of echoes through uh, the Old Testament. But here they're first at Shechem, and here the, the king has a son, and the, the king's son takes a look at one of Jacob's daughters named Dinah, and he's just moved with her. He just thinks she's the best thing that's ever happened. Instead of going to Jacob, instead he just takes her, forces himself upon her. He rapes her. And so instead of Jacob moving forward with this, declaring justice, he just shrinks away once more. Act like nothing happened. Let's just move along. Let's cover it up. Let, let's just go along to get along. He is passive. He is retreating. He is a coward. And then sometime later, the prince comes to him and the king comes to him and it says, you know, my son is just really likes your daughter. We want your daughter. And he just, you know, kind of shrinks away and cowers, doesn't bring up the issue, doesn't bring up the offense, doesn't deal with problems, just covers them up and retreats. But his sons didn't do that. So Simeon and Levi, they decide, you know, that, hey, something has to be done. If dad won't do it, then we will do it. And so there they strike a bargain with the Hivites and they say, you know what, we'll give you our daughter or you will give you our sister's hand in marriage. But the problem is, is that you're not circumcised. So if you become like us, then we can agree to this. So you and all of the men in your encampment have to first be circumcised. And after that happens, then we'll freely give them uh, give her your give you her hand in marriage and so they follow through with it and then on the third day after they are greatly sore scripture says Simeon and Levi go in and kill all the men in the town slaughter them all and Jacob's reaction to this isn't against the Hivites for, their, uh, for this great tragedy that has taken place, this great harm that was done to his family. And here it's not against his sons for this great brutality that had taken place. But rather he comes to him and he says, you're going to make people not like us. Look at what you've done. You're going to bring shame to us. It literally says, you're going to make us stink to the neighboring tribes around us. He's worried about his... He's worried about his reputation. He's not worried about what's right and what's just and what's moral. He's not worried about his family. He's just worried about his public persona, what others may think. We see even with the family strife that existed in his family between Rachel and Leah, we never see him intervene. We never see him put it down. We never see him do anything. We just see him pass it along. Even when Reuben lays with one of his wives in incest. He doesn't address it. He just moves the blessing of the family off of Reuben, who's the firstborn. He moves it across Simeon and Levi, who were number two and number three. And now the family blessing rests upon his son, Judah. So here, Joseph is born into this family with a weak, passive, retreating father, 
more worried about what everybody else thinks out in the world than dealing with the true problems that exist in his family. Instead of raising his children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, he raised them in the fear of everyone around them and the admonition to just keep your mouth shut. He's disobeying God. And here, as a father, Jacob ends up with 12 sons by four different baby mamas. That's a mess. He's born to Rachel, who is uh, Jacob's favorite wife. He's the 11th out of 12 sons. And we see that because he is the child of old age, that here he is the child of blessing. His father takes a great care upon Joseph. He loves Joseph. And this is typical. You know, he's raised differently than his other brothers, which is typical when there is a child born in later years. You have struggle babies, and then you have blessing babies. And when you're born and you're, you first start out with your family, incomes are low, there's an expense for everything you're trying to acquire, you're trying to establish. And so in that, those first children who come along, those are struggle babies. And so they get to hear about the, you know, uh, uh, a box of macaroni and cheese uh, every other week and having to split peas like uh, Ebony or what was that, Tiny Tim on the Christmas Carol and all this, you know, and not having furniture and having to sit on boxes and all of these different stories come along with those struggle babies. But then later in life, after incomes increase, after promotions happen, as we go along and things are beginning to be paid for and we have acquired some assets, then we start to get into those late in life blessing babies. Now, how many of y'all were struggle babies? Yeah. How many of y'all were blessing babies? I was blessing baby. I was a uh oh, 12 years after the last kid was born, uh, baby. All right, I was the blessing baby. And so in that, they talk about, y'all remember, you know, only getting one gift for Christmas? I have no idea what you're talking about. No, I mean, I got the store for Christmas, you know, everything. You know, and so in that, there's a whole difference between the struggle babies and the blessing babies. And so Joseph comes along, and he's the blessing baby. Uh, Jacob had already acquired great wealth. He had herds upon herds. And there he had birthed 10 little herdsmen who went out to the field to take care of his wealth, to take care of his prosperity. And they were even venturing 50 miles away from their home in order to feed their flocks. That's a lot of sheep. That's a lot. 50 miles away. It's like here to Montgomery to feed your, to feed your sheep. That's a lot of sheep. And so Joseph, as a blessing baby, coming along in later part of life, being the firstborn son of his favorite wife, here he makes a difference between the rest of his children and Joseph. And as Joseph grows up, he doesn't grow up out in the field. He grows up in the house. He's daddy's right-hand man. He's daddy's little helper. And we'll shove off all the other kids to go make daddy some money. But you stay here and you entertain daddy and you be blessed by daddy and you eat the fat with daddy and you do all the good things with daddy. And so Joseph is raised in this environment, and here, as he becomes of age, he becomes 17 years old, his dad makes him this coat of many colors. Now, it's easy for us just to go into the nursery, uh, you know, the, the uh, Sunday school version of this and say, he made him a real pretty coat, and everybody else had the regular coats, and they were just jealous because of how pretty his coat was. But that's not it. It was an ornamental tunic that was worn, and this tunic signified that he was going to be the heir of the family. He was the future leadership of the family. And here, this is placed upon not the firstborn, no, not Reuben, not upon the second or third, not Simeon, not Levi, because here Reuben had disgraced him. Reuben uh, had, had uh, committed a great harm against his dad. So there, Reuben's out. He's done forever. Number two, number three, you go and you embarrass dad by standing up and doing something that dad probably should have done. Instead of uh, where dad retreated away from a problem, here they addressed it in a brutal fashion because they never saw what a real man was. They never saw how a real man dealt with problems. And so they had no idea of what justice or maturity was. And so here they act upon their emotions because they are angry and they are mad and they were never shown how 
to deal with their emotions. They were ruled by them instead of ruling over them. And so here, well, you've disgraced me, so we got to pass over two, we got to pass over three. Here's Judah. Judah hasn't done anything wrong as of yet, but let me skip over number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, and I'm going to give the family leadership to number 11, Joseph. He's going to lead the flocks, even though he's never tended to the flock. He's going to lead the house, even though he's never left the house. Here, he's going to be the, the son of promise. He's going to be the one who, who is in charge of it all, even though he's been charged with nothing. Do you see how his brothers could resent him? Do you see how his brothers could be angry with him? How his brothers could have absolutely nothing good to say about him? How the very appearance of him on the hillside coming towards them instantly brings up the conversation of, let's kill him and hide the body. And it wasn't anything to do with Joseph. In fact, Scripture has three people to which no guilt is ever assigned to them. It is Joseph, it is Daniel, and it is Jesus. So we have no reason to hate upon Joseph. We have no reason uh, that is justified in their mind for them to uh, condemn Joseph. Their condemnation was actually on Jacob. And Jacob's, hand, Jacob's handling of his family, Jacob's handling of his children. The flaws and the errors were Jacob's. Those sins that Joseph is going to pay for were not Joseph's sins. They were Jacob's sins. Jacob created a mess. Joseph paid the price for that mess. The gospel narrative in there somewhere, isn't there? And so into this mess, he, he gives them this coat of many colors he declares blessing and leadership upon number 11 instead of where it belonged in number 1. Here he's shown them how to retreat and how to be cowardly, but he's also shown them what? How to not forgive and hold grudges. Because number 1 wasn't good enough. One mistake, you're out. Number 2 and number 3, one mistake and you're out. So his brothers hated him. We come along to this story where we find this pit. And Jacob hears that his sons are out feeding the sheep and that his sons have gone to Shechem. Now, what's the problem with Shechem? The problem with Shechem is that Shechem just appeared a couple of chapters ago, and Shechem was the place where Dinah got raped, where, J where Jacob retreated, and where Simeon and Levi went in and killed all the guys. So Shechem's not a real friendly place. That's not somewhere where uh, your family should show up again. That's the place where we avoid. We don't go near there, but in their opinion, they're thinking, well, there's no problem here. We've taken care of it. There's no men, like, you know, there's not other tribes and family members around there. You know, you know there's no horror rights running around. There's no descendants who share a lineage or have covenants with those people. And so they foolishly go back into Shechem. And here Jacob hears about this trip into Shechem to feed his flocks. And he looks at Joseph and he says, will you go and find your brothers and tell me if we have any brothers left? Will you go find and see if we have any sheep left? Or if they've come in there and if they've granted revenge, if they've killed all the sons, if they've taken all the flocks, just go see what if we have anything left. And then we see Joseph, he says, yes, sir, absolutely. He's obedient to the father. He goes straight away, right away. And the very next thing that we see is that he is in Shechem and he's walking through the fields just looking to see if he can see anything. And his brothers aren't there. They're not the 40 or 50 miles away. They've actually gone another 10 to 15 miles further than that into Dothan. And so he ventures into there, and as he comes upon the hillside, and his brothers can see him, they instantly think, we should kill this guy. I mean, he's cost us everything. He's nothing but problems. As, long, as soon as he came along, now he's a boss over us. He's bossing us around. He don't even know how to do what we do. He hasn't lived the life that we've lived. These are supposed to be his sheep. Well, we're the ones out here tending to it. All this boy, all that hatred, all that animosity, all that jealousy, all that rage just starts stirring up. And here they start, you know, talking back and forth. And, and, and it just keeps building and increasing upon each other until finally they just say, well, yeah, we're going to kill him. And Reuben said, well, let's not kill him. 
you know, let, let's just put him in a pit. You know, he'll learn his lesson. Reuben says, well, I'll come back and get him. Reuben seems to be an okay guy. He just made a mistake. And so he says, well, I'll come back and I'll get him, and then I'll take him back to dad, and he'll be safe. He don't belong out here. We'll get him back where he belongs. And so they take him, and the very first thing that they did, the very first action against Joseph was what? They took that coat off. Do you see the point? Do you, do you see what they were really after? All that animosity wasn't necessarily on that boy. It was on that coat. It was on the actions of his father. It wasn't about Joseph. It was about Jacob. And they take that coat off. They strip it off of him. They push him into the pit. And then they just sit down and you know, crack open a can of Ienes and just have an old campfire supper. Have a good time. And then they start to see this group of Midianites, these traders who were taking goods into Egypt to sell them. And Judah looks and he goes, you know what? I'm supposed to inherit all of this family. I'm supposed to inherit all this stuff. But you know what? Dad took it away from me. Dad gave it to old Junior over there. He said, you know what? I'm going to get a little something off of this. He said, instead of killing them, what if we sell them? And they say, well, yeah, you know, we'll split that a little bit. And, you know, we each get a little bit of something. We got to look after us because dad's not looking after us. So, yeah, you know, let's do this. And so there they take matters into their own hand and they sell him to the Midianites for the price of a handicapped slave. That shows what they thought of them, right? They didn't even get the price of a slave. They got the price of a handicapped slave because in their eyes, he's, he's useless. He's not even a full-blown man. I mean, he's just daddy's boy. He's, you know, he's one of them house babies. And, and so in that, you know, they just got whatever price that they could get for him. They didn't even have a high regard for his work ethic, for his abilities, for his skills, because they'd never seen it. All they'd seen is him sitting in the tent with dad all day. And so they sell him to the Midianites for 20 pieces of silver, the price of a handicapped slave. And then they take the tunic, they dip it in goat's blood, they take it back to their dad, and here they deceive the deceiver. All that deception, all that lies, all that fantasy and fairy tale, all that shaping and molding, all that exaggeration, all that framing the argument so that we can get away with it, so that we can do these mental gymnastics to justify what we want to do. Now Jacob has taught his sons how to do that exact same thing. So they dip it in the goat's blood. They take it to their dad. Their dad is, is upset. He's torn. They say, you know, is, is this your son's coat? As if they didn't know that coat, if they couldn't draw it with their eyes closed. Is this your son's coat? And he goes, oh, this is my son's coat. Oh, he's been torn apart by some wild animal. He's been ravaged. He's surely he's dead. And here he becomes greatly distraught, and they try to comfort him. And he says, no, I'm so upset that I just want to die so that I can go and be with my son. He's got 11 others. But here he's shown such favoritism. He's shown such partiality to this one that here this one child is everything. This one thing overlooks all of Jacob's blessings. It overlooks all of how God has used them, all that God has given them, it, over all of his other children. And here he's so upset to the point of death over this one child. And he said, I'd rather die than live here with you other 11. I'd rather, I'd rather just go and, and just go into the afterlife with this one child and leave you other 11 behind. I mean, I don't want to stay here and be with you. And here, Jacob tells his sons exactly what he thinks of them. He tells them exactly how he feels about them. And what we'll see from here on out is, is Joseph living righteously, even in unrighteous times? And even when Joseph is dealt harshly with, he continues to be obedient. He continues to be truthful, and he continues to be faithful, even when he's in the pit, when he's in Potiphar's house, when he's in prison, and even when he makes it to Pharaoh's right-hand side, he's still faithful. He still just does what's right. And we see those prophecies and those dreams instead of that his dad should have taken and used and pondered and, and looked forward uh, to, to the course of history that was to come. We see them play out and we see those prophecies be fulfilled as those 
other 11 come into Egypt and they bow before him. And they need his assistance. And we see him forgive. We see him be honest and trustworthy. And we see none of those character flaws that were passed into the other 11. We don't see them in Joseph. So what are our, what are our, what are our lessons that we can glean off of this? First off, glaringly, alarmingly bright, we see, number one, dads, if you don't drive your family, they will careen out of control. We see that the impact of dads upon the household are outrageously predominant. That they are in the forefront of everything. The dad in the household, he controls the spiritual climate. He controls the educational climate. He controls the moral climate. Dad is in control of all of those elements. And in our society today, we see a society that is careening out of control, who has lost its mind, that people don't even know what bathroom to use. They don't know how to grow up, get married, carry on a job, raise children. We have grown adults who don't know how to feed them themselves unless it comes out of a frozen box or handed to them in a bag out of a window. We have lost all sense of reason and control and justice. And why have we done that? Because dads became passive. Because dads pursued their own interests over the interests of their families. Because dads decided that some things were more important than their kids and then their wives and then their homes. And so they erected idols, and whatever these idols may be that men began to serve, whether it be the, the God of sex, whether it be the God of violence, whether it be the God of lust, whether it be the God of greed, whether it be the God of entertainment, whether it be the God of leisure, that here dads in our society have erected these altars where they've begun to sacrifice their wives, and they've begun to sacrifice their children upon those altars of a lost, fallen Babylon in which we live, instead of serving the one true God. What's the problem with the world today? Dads, or a lack of. Statistics some time ago said that the, the rate, the birth rate to single mothers is approaching 60%. 60%. In the black community, it's as high as 80%. And every other demographic is following right behind there, constantly. Why? Because of dads. Because of men. Because we've decided that we'd take the easy road. Because it's hard to be a dad. It's hard to stand forward. And we see our society, 90% of homeless and runaway youth, single mother homes. 71% of high school dropouts in America, no dad at home. 63% of youth suicides, no dad at home. The explosive growth, the difference between the, uh, the uh, having only a mother, having a birth father and a birth mother in the home show up in every major category. The rampant increase in divorce, there's a rampant increase in drug use, there's a rampant increase in sexually transmitted diseases, in unemployment, in welfare, it all skyrockets. When dad's not there. Why? Because God made dad the leader. Because God holds dad responsible. Because God placed dad in the home as a pastor in the home. Because God looks to the man to lead and exert his authority. To be an example of God in the home. There was a study done some time ago. And it said that. You know, in churches, they, among churches, among church-going people, they did this survey. And they found that if a child is the first one to uh, make a profession of faith in a family, so through vacation Bible school, through different outreaches, if somehow the child is reached first, whether it be a, a young child or a teenager, then 3% of the time the rest of the family makes a profession of faith. 3%. If mom is the first to make a, a profession of faith, 17% of the time, the rest of the family makes a profession of faith. Anybody want to take a guess at what it is if dad's the first one to make a profession of faith? 93% of the time. Guys, 
your position and your value in your home cannot be understated. It cannot be any, uh, there's nothing more important in your life than how you lead your family. And if you don't step forward and if you don't lead, if you lead with passivity, if you lead with cowardice, if you're always shrinking back, if you're always playing from retreat, then what you're leading is a mess. You're driving your family towards disaster. The second thing that we see is that dad's sin is a big deal. Guys, our relationship with God, we've got to get it right. We've got to get it right in a hurry. We've got to fix things, man. You know, we have to lead from the front, not from behind, because in that whatever our sin is, it will manifest in the family. It will echo through generations, but not only in generational curses, but, man, just absolutely in the examples that we set. The things that we say are okay, our children will take further than we do. So if we say that lying is okay, then guess what? We're going to raise a bunch of liars. If we say that anger is okay, we're going to raise a bunch of brutal people. If we say that, um, that God just isn't that important, that God's not as important as the ball game, God's not as important as the race, God's not as important as the, the fishing lake or the deer stand, or God's not as important as the golf course, uh, God's not as important as the ballpark, if we make those declarations, guess what? Your children and your grandchildren will echo them and they will increase. They will. And so whatever dad's God is will absolutely get passed down through the generations of his family. Your children will serve the God that you serve. It may be the God of football. And your children will be rabid football fans and bust hell wide open. Or maybe it's the, the God of, of, of hunting and fishing and outdoors and all this kind of stuff. And, and in that, man, they will be terrific marksmen. And they will be outrageous uh, and skilled archers. And, and they will know how to hunt and how to track and how to skin and how to clean and how to process and bust hell wide open. Or maybe it's greed. And, man, you know, we teach them how to turn a dollar into 10 and, and how to buy and low and sell high. And, man, we, we just got it. And we're just issuing money hand over fist. And, man, we teach our kids, and our kids are outrageously economically prosperous, and they bust hell wide open. Maybe we teach them that life is all about them. And we cater to them and we nurture to them and whatever they want. And we just cow down and we bow to them and we teach them that they're the most important thing in the world. And it doesn't matter if we've got to drive to the other side of town to get the right kind of uh, chicken nuggets or whatever. Well, however we got to do, you know, babies just got to be catered to and baby has to be pandered to. And then they grow up and they worship themselves and they destroy every relationship that they ever have and they bust hell wide open. So what God are you going to teach your children about? What example are you going to set for your children and for your grandchildren? Is it that we just simply go to church on Sunday and we look nice and we smell good and we put on this show and then as, as soon as we get in the car, we listen to filth all the way home and we get home and we turn on the filth box and we watch the filth. And even if we watch good programs, we're evangelized through the filthy commercials and, uh, and then we just consume, consume, consume. We look like the world, dress like the world, smell like the world, go where the world goes, read the books of the world, educated in the world. We do all the world stuff, but we just go to church for an hour on Sunday. It's a good way to raise lost kids too. Or do we truly have a relationship with God? Is he really our God? Does every decision in our family revolve around what does God say? What's an example I can pull off of? Where's wisdom that I can find in Scripture? Let me find a, a good, godly, older man that can uh, disciple me in the ways of God that I can ask questions to and I can go, man, you've been married for 50 or 60 years. What's the trick? What's the secret? What, what, what are you doing that's working? Where we see men who have raised godly children in the Lord who have continued in faithfulness and obedience to God in their adulthood and who are now raising faithful and mature children in the Lord and we go to that man and we go now what'd you do what do I need to do what what was the principles what what how did you raise your family what give me some wisdom give me some insight what am I doing wrong you tell me because if I can't stand up under your judgment there's no way I can stand up underneath God's judgment and so in that I want you to speak into my life I want you to tell me brutal hard truths because you know what I want my children not to be like your children I want my children to be better than your children and we're humble enough to ask and we're humble enough to seek 
when we're humble enough to admit that we ain't got it all figured out and that we need advice and wisdom and counsel and we need to be taught the word of God again. Because we've become ignorant of God's word. And our churches, which are supposed to be places of rich uh, fulfillment in the word of God, have become absolutely absent of it. So dads, we can't, we can't declare it enough. You drive your family or else it'll careen out of control. And dad, your sin is a big deal. Your sin's a big deal. And I know we live in a world, man, that has just lost its mind. That has just absolutely gone crazy. But in that, we can find righteousness and we can find right paths and we can find good doctrine and we can find good examples if we look for them they're not on the tv they're not on the radio they're not in the magazines they're probably not on facebook or instagram but we can find those examples if we look for them you know one of the greatest testimonies that joseph gave was not not even when he was in Potiphar's house and it said that he was a good-looking man. He was so good that when he came in, that Potiphar's wife and her, her, uh, and her friends were sitting around. They were eating oranges and peeling them with a knife. And he was so good-looking that they cut themselves with the knives from Galkin. That's never happened to me. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine how good-looking he was if that's never happened to me. You know? And so in that, you know, here he, he is beautiful. He is handsome. He is rugged. He is strong, all of this. And, and here Potiphar's wife, who's one of the richest, wealthiest, most powerful women in all of Egypt, here she comes after him and he says, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that to Potiphar. I'm not going to do that to my Lord. And then he's thrown into prison. He's faithful in the prison. And there, that's not even the greatest testimony. And then, as he's faithful in the prison, he's promoted out and he's put into the palace. And there, he's, he's uh, uh, Pharaoh's right-hand man. And that's not even the greatest testimony of Joseph. The greatest testimony of Joseph is after spending years, spending decades in Egypt. Surrounded by godlessness, surrounded by uh, uh, sex cults and fornication and lewdness and greed and, and having all of this at his, at his fingertips that he could have accessed any of it. He could have easily said, you know what, I haven't seen a Hebrew since I was 17. I left home at 17 never to return, never to go back to dad's house, never to, to go back into dad's tent, never to do any of this again. And from 17 until his old age where he finally births children into this world, do you know what he names his children? Hebrew names. He gives his children Hebrew names. 17 years in a Hebrew household that was broken and dysfunctional. And then some 30, 40 years later, he names his children Hebrew names. He names one and he names them. He says, forget. I'm going to name one child. I name him forget. Manasseh. He says, you know, the Lord's made me forget all of that offense, all of that mess, all of the brokenness in my old age. I've looked back. I realize life is tough. Life is hard. People make mistakes. I, I just I just forgive them. A quality that his dad never showed. A quality that his dad never had. Never forgave Reuben. Never forgave Levi. Never forgave Simeon. Here he forgives. Then he has another child and he names him Ephraim, which means fruitful. God's made me fruitful. God's been so good to me. I'm going to forget all that mess that's behind me, and I'm just going to remember God's great fruitfulness that he's blessed, with, blessed me with. I'm not going to carry offense. I'm not going to adopt a victimhood mentality. I'm not going to just pour me and shrink back and, oh, waller in all the problems. Now, nah, man, I'm just going to forget all of that stuff. I'm just going to concentrate on God's blessedness before me. Twice as long living in Egypt as he ever was in, an Egypt, in a Hebrew home. He gives them Hebrew names. Hadn't been to church in 30 years, gives them Hebrew names. Raises them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And even and it, and as he is dying and in his, in his last will and his last rites, his last instructions for his people, he tells them, don't you bury my bones in Egypt. I don't belong here. 
Don't, don't you dig me a grave. Don't you stick me in a hole because I don't belong in Egypt. I belong in the promised land. That's the greatest testimony of Joseph in all of Scripture is that even living in a pagan, immoral, lost, crooked, broken world, he lived righteously. And he realized he wasn't a part of that system. He wasn't a part of that world. He raised his children right in a world of wrong. And even as he looked towards the future, he knew that Egypt is not our home, that here we are of another country, we're of another place, and we just simply happen to be habitating here. But this isn't our home. Today, guys, this isn't our home. That's why there's bruises, and that's why there's briars, and that's where there's thorns, and that's where all the hardship and all the tears that we suffer in this world, that our eyes cry, is to remind us that this isn't heaven, and it's never going to be. We don't belong here. Our home is somewhere else. And as we live in a broken, fallen world, let us remember that we're Christians. More than Americans, we're Christians. More than, uh, more than Alabamians, we're Christians. More than War Eagle or Roll Tide, we're Christians. I know that was hard. That hurt, didn't it? Yeah, I saw some of y'all. Y'all grimaced. Oh, yeah. But in that, you know, it's more, you know, here we identify not with the things of this world, but rather we're just here for a time, but our bones belong in another place. Our eternal location is somewhere else. And so with that in mind, Dads, lead your family. Dads, deal with your sin. Pastor your wife. Pastor your children. Find godly role models. And live your faith out loud in front of them. Let them see you make mistakes. Let them see you repent. Let them see you learn and do better. Be open. Be honest with your children. One of the worst things that you can ever do with your children is pretend like you're perfect. Don't, re don't pretend. Repent. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for loving us, for blessing us, Father, for your word. Father, we pray that you would help us, Father, to see these mistakes, to see these errors. And, Father, not to become haughty or prideful or think that we've figured it all out. But, Father, in humility to realize that if not for your leading, if not for your Holy Spirit uh, convicting us, Father, we'd do the exact same thing. We may not have made these mistakes, but, Lord, we've made a whole bunch of different ones. And, Lord, let us be humble. Let us be repentant. But Lord, let us always be teachable. Let us always be ones who can do better, who are striving to do better, who aren't settling back and saying this is good enough or that I'm doing better than somebody else or point to those who are worse off and say, well, at least I'm not that. Or let us not be hypocrites and let us not be Pharisees. But Father, let us be humble, obedient servants of you. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We love you, Father. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us stand.